Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 27 and in this lecture we are going to discuss theory of beams. So, till now we discussed about bending of beams, torsion of beams, bending of unsymmetrical beams, applying shear force to beams and then we found out what is the shear stress distribution in the beam, but now we want to know how does a beam deflect when we apply distributed load on the beam or we apply terminal force and moment on the beam. Okay. For example, suppose that we have this beam So, that is my beam and suppose it is clamped at one end ok. So, beams are always characterized by a length and cross section. So, let me write here beams are geometrically characterized by length and cross section. So, a body like this for example, is not a beam because it has no length and there is nothing like a cross section. So, it is an arbitrary three dimensional body whereas a beam which we have on the left hand side we can see it has got a length l and then the cross section has got some dimension also which is d and usually for beam l by d which is also the aspect ratio so that's of the order of 10 or higher Okay. So, it becomes slender. So, beams are like slender bodies all right and our goal is to obtain deflection of beam. Now, you see we can also solve this deflection problem using three dimensional theory of elasticity. So, when you view this beam as a 3D body then we will think that it has got traction acting on the top surface you know, so we will have traction on the top surface, which could also be tilted and could be varying in magnitude. And then on this end also there could be some traction. And if we want to solve the deformation problem, then we have to solve the partial differential equation corresponding to the stress equilibrium equation. So, can you recall? our equation which was del sigma x x over del x plus del tau x y over del y plus del tau x z over del z plus body force is equal to rho times acceleration. Likewise, we have two other equations. And this equation right now is in terms of stress we substitute stress strain relation and strain displacement relation then finally this becomes an equation in the displacement of every point of this three dimensional body so we can obtain by solving this displacement u of every point of this body but then we get it at the cost of solving this partial differential equation so, it is a basically partial differential equation in three dimensions and you know usually it is difficult to solve such equations using paper and pencil and then we have to resort to computer and we have to do some numerical computation, but when we 
do that numerical computation, we indeed get displacement of every point of this body. But in beam theory, our goal is not to get the displacement of every point of this body. No, suppose think of a center line of this body. So, think of a center line which could be joining the centroid of every cross section of this beam. Okay. So, that is the center line joining the centroid of all cross sections. Now, how will this beam actually deform when we have these tractions acting? It is possible that the beam deforms and becomes something like this. Is not it? And then the center line would be somewhere over here. Correct. So, that is a general deformation, but let us think of an approximate deformation, approximate form of deformation. In which we accurately represent the deformed center line. But then the cross section, the deformation of the cross section we neglect. So, plane section for example, remains planar. So, you can actually start constructing your cross section here, is not it about this center line. And then the envelope of this cross section. that becomes your approximate deformed beam. Now, compare the two shapes here. What is missing in the two shapes is the deformation of the cross section. So, cross section deformation is missing on the right. is not it. But you know it turns out if your body is slender enough and when it gets deformed then indeed the cross sectional deformations are negligible. Okay. So, I can write that here. It turns out if the body is slender enough then the cross sectional deformations is indeed negligible Okay. And in that case, you can just be happy with the knowledge of the deformed center line. If you just know the center line, you can simply construct your entire body by putting the cross section, the rigid cross section and you can get the shape of the deformed 3D body, is not it? So, beam theory is actually about knowing just the center line. Okay. Beam theory, it only tells us
above the center line. And then you will see there are advanced beam theory which tells us not only the center line, but also the cross sectional orientation. But then again that theory also assumes that the cross section is rigid. So, you know when you drew this picture, we had this center line, but then the cross section we can put it in several ways. You can either put it this way, so that the normal to the cross section is aligned with the center line tangent. So, the cross section normal is aligned with the center line tangent. Or you could also put it in a different way. Something like this. But still the cross sections are rigid. You put the same rigid cross section, but the orientation is such that the cross section normal and the center line tangents are not aligned. So, in this case you can see cross section normal is like this, here it gets aligned, but not everywhere. right? So, orientation of the cross section is also a variable, but the cross section itself is rigid. So, if we are only happy with just knowing the deformed center line and the orientation of the cross section, then it turns out that the equations required to obtain these two variables that is the center line and the cross section orientation is just an ODE, an ordinary differential equation. It is not the full blown PDE that you see here in this box. Okay. So, let me complete this line here beam theory it only tells us about the center line and cross section orientation. And just because we do not solve for the cross sectional deformation, therefore the equations to obtain center line and the cross sectional orientation they are simply ODEs, the equations are simple ordinary differential equations, which are much easier to solve than partial differential equations. You can actually in many cases get analytical solutions also. Okay? So, beam theory is just an ODE whereas the three dimensional elasticity theory is a PDE. But then if you can solve the PDE, the equations of 3D elasticity, you get the displacement of every point. So, that also gives you the cross sectional deformation, but in beam theory you do not get the cross sectional deformation. And as I told you when the body is slender enough, when L by D is really large, then cross sectional deformations are negligible and you can indeed be happy with beam theory. Okay. So, let us start with the simplest beam theory and that is called Euler Bernoulli beam theory. So, in this theory 
it is assumed that the center line tangent and the normal to the cross section they are aligned. Okay. So, this theory assumes that center line tangent and cross section normal are aligned. So, we had drawn that picture. So, suppose that this is your center line, then the cross section has to be put in such a way that the normal is along the tangent. So, here is the tangent let us say, then the cross section has to be put such that the tangent is also aligned with the cross section normal. Okay. So, we can put many more cross sections here. So, at every point the tangents and the cross section normal they are aligned. All right. And then the question is what equations should we solve so that we can get the center line, the deformed center line. So, we can all recall the bending of beam formula. So, you can recall this formula that E i times the curvature that is equal to the bending moment, is not it? So, we have a beam and whatever is the bending moment in the cross section, the curvature over there is m by E i. Okay. But then what is the formula for curvature? From the differential geometry, you would have found out that curvature is d 2 y by d x 2 divided by 1 plus d y by d x to the power whole square and then whole thing we have to take the power 3 by 2. Okay. So, it is a non-linear expression in terms of the deflection y. So, y is the deflection here. Suppose that your beam is initially straight. Okay. So, suppose this is the beam which is initially straight. So, the center line is this red line that is a straight line, but after deformation it could become something like this, right. And we are confining ourselves to planar deformation. That means, the center line remains in this plane itself. So, if this is your x axis that is your y axis and this is z axis, then after deformation also the center line remains in x y plane. Center line remains in x y plane after deformation. Okay. So, we have x axis and y axis and y axis tells me the deflection, the transverse deflection of the beam's center line, which we will also call as the deflection of the beam itself. Okay. And x, so that is the axial displacement, is not it? And in the formula for curvature, we have x and y. So, both axial displacement of the beam as well as the transverse deflection of the beam, they are usually unknown. Even if you clamp your beam at one end, no, even if you clamp it, and suppose you had applied some force here, then after deflection, 
it could become something like this right and you see the right cross section for example has undergone this axial displacement and it has also undergone transverse displacement okay so y and x both are unknown so if we draw just the center line then x comma y both are unknown and to obtain curvature we have to know both x and y okay but in this euler bernoulli beam theory we are going to assume that axial displacement is negligible okay this is another assumption the first one was that the center line tangent and the cross section normal they are aligned and then we say that axial displacement is also negligible so this means your small x that is the deformed position in the x direction is same as the undeformed position let us call it big x okay so for any cross section which is at big x finally it would only deflect in the y direction there is no deflection in the x direction okay so that's what i mean when we say there is no axial displacement so if we take that approximation into account then the curvature simply becomes a function of big x which is the undeformed position and this is d2y over dx2 divided by 1 plus dy by dx whole square to the power 3 by 2 okay so that is the non linear expression for curvature now we are going to do further approximations to arrive at our final euler bernoulli beam theory we want to come up with a linear equation for the deflection of the beam y okay so we will first of all find out the formula for curvature which is linear in y so to do that what do you think what approximations should we make if we say that dy by dx which is the slope isn't it if this is very very close to 0 okay so that's the slope of the center line so if we say it is very very close to zero then the denominator here gets approximated by 1 isn't it it is 1 plus dy by dx to the whole square and since dy by dx is very close to zero let's say it is 0 0.01 so dy by dx whole square becomes 10 to the power minus 4 so 1 plus 10 to the power minus 4 is very close to 1 itself and in that case we can approximate this by simply d2y by dx2 so now curvature becomes linear in the transverse deflection y okay now let's come back to our formula for the bending we can now say that e i times curvature which is d 2 i by d x 2 is equal to the bending moment m of x. Okay. So, that is our Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Okay. So, basically you have this center line and at any point big x. So, here you go by big x so we are saying that there is no axial displacement so a point is simply moving upward 
So, at any point big X, think of the circle over here, the local circle and then this is the radius of that local circle. So, we are saying that d 2 y by d x 2 is approximated by 1 by r, okay, the local radius of the circle. So, from the bending of beam formula, we are able to relate curvature to moment and finally, the second derivative of deflection to bending moment. So, if we can solve this equation for y, then we get the deflection of the beam, is not it? So, this is called Euler Bernoulli beam theory. In short, we will call it as EBT, Euler Bernoulli theory. So, let us try to obtain deflection for beams using this formula. So, let us do the first example. So, suppose we have a beam which is clamped at one end and we are applying transverse load at the other end. Let us call that load is P. And then we have to apply the Euler Bernoulli theory to obtain the deflection of this beam. All right. So, in order to do that, you see this is the equation for the deflection. So, as you can see, we have to first obtain bending moment as a function of x. So, we first need to obtain bending moment profile. Okay. So, let us cut a section here and look at the cut part of the beam. So, we have the shear force P acting here and at the cut section whose normal is in the negative i direction, we will have shear force acting downward as positive right? and bending moment clockwise would be positive. m of x and for the other section here shear force upward that is v of x because this section is positive section and bending moment anti clockwise we have m of x. Right? Anyway, let us look at the moment balance for the right section. Now, how much is this length? This is L minus x supposing that the cut was made at x. So, this becomes L minus x. So, when we do the moment balance for the section, we have minus m of x, right? because you see on the left section m is clockwise. So, we get minus m of x plus the moment due to the force P about the point on the left section. So, we get P into L minus x and then the moment due to the shear force V, this is going to vanish because it is passing through the point itself. So, this should be equal to 0 that implies M of x is equal to P into L minus x. So, we can plug it in this formula and finally, we get d 2 y by d x 2 is equal to p by e i times L minus x. Okay. So, that is the equation that we have with us now and how many boundary conditions will be required to solve this equation? So, it is a second order differential equation. So, whatever is the order of equation, we need that many boundary conditions, is not it? And if we had any extra unknowns, we would require that many additional boundary conditions. 
So, here we do not have any extra unknowns. So, this requires two boundary conditions. So, what could be the boundary condition? See at x equal to 0, the beam is clamped, the entire cross section is clamped. So, that means the center line at x equal to 0 cannot deflect neither the cross section at x equal to 0 can rotate, is not it. So, clamped means the displacement y of 0 is equal to 0 and the rotation is also 0. But since in this theory the cross section rotation and the center line tangent they are aligned. So, the slope of the center line itself gives me the cross section rotation and since the cross section rotation is 0 that means the slope is also 0, right. So, we get dy by dx also equal to 0 at x equal to 0. So, these are the two boundary conditions which we have to apply over here. So, let us do the integration. So, when we work out the first integration, we get dy by dx is equal to p by e i into Lx minus x square by 2, correct, plus a constant of integration c 1. Then we do another integration and we get y equal to p by e i into L x square by 2 minus x cube by 6 plus c 1 into x plus c 2. Now, to get the integrating constants, we have to apply boundary conditions. So, the first boundary condition y 0 equal to 0, when we plug it in this formula, it simply tells us that c 2 is equal to 0, right. And the second boundary condition that d y by d x at 0 is equal to 0, tells us that c 1 is also 0. Okay. So, finally, we can write it very nicely that y is equal to p l cube by 6 e i okay, into x by l whole square multiplied by 3 minus x by l to the power whole cube. Okay. So, that is the formula for the deflection y as a function of x and if you want to know what is the tip deflection that means when x is equal to l what do we have. So, when you substitute it you get y of l equal to p l q over 3 e i. Okay. So, deflection of the tip of the beam due to applied force P is P L cube by 3 E i. So, larger the force, larger the deflection, larger the bending stiffness E i, smaller is the deflection. Okay. Let us work out another example. So, in this case think of a beam which what we say is simply supported. So, here is the beam and it is simply supported. I will tell you what does it mean when we say simply supported and it is subjected to constant distributed load. This could for example, be the weight of the beam itself. So, if it is the weight of the beam, then the distributed load which is force per unit length would be rho g times the cross sectional area A. So, that is rho A g. Okay. And then it is simply supported. So, simply supported means that there is no bending moment at the contact. 
Okay, so we say it is simply supported. So, it is actually a line contact. So, whenever there is a line contact between the beam and the support, can you think of what kind of reaction we will get? So, we will have traction through the line, is not it? So, if this is that line, we will have line force. from the support and when you find out what is the moment due to this line force about this line itself. So, since all of these line forces are passing through the line itself, so the moment becomes 0. So, whenever we have line contact, then moment about that line is 0, we should always remember that. Okay? So, therefore, in this case, the moment about that line. So, we have x here, y here and z. So, we have contact along the z axis. So, moment about the z axis m z is then 0 at the two ends. Okay? So, this means no bending moment. at the support, but there will be some transverse load at the support, is not it? Because it cannot have any displacement, the beam is put on the support, it cannot go freely downward. So, the support has to apply some reaction, which in this case is a line force. So, when you integrate this line force, you will get some transverse load. So, there will be some transverse load all right and as a rule of thumb you can remember this table. So, we have displacement and transverse load. So, if displacement is given to be 0, then the transverse load is an unknown. Okay? So, it is a cross means it is an unknown. If transverse load is given to be 0, then displacement is an unknown, displacement in the same direction as the transverse load, which is the deflection of the beam in this case. Okay? And then for rotation also you can think the same way, we have rotation about z axis and moment about z axis. You see the cross sections are all rotating about z axis only. So, whenever the support is such that the rotation is 0, so for example, in case of clamped support the cross section cannot rotate, is not it? So, if rotation is given to be 0, then bending moment is an unknown at the clamped support, bending moment will not be 0. Likewise, if moment is 0, which is the case here for simply supported beams. If the support is such that it cannot exert any bending moment, then rotation is an unknown there. So, in this case, the cross sections can rotate at the support. In the clamped case, cross section cannot rotate, but in the simply supported case, whenever we have line contact, cross section can rotate. All right. So, if we want to solve this problem, we again apply the Euler Bernoulli beam theory.
and again we require the bending moment profile m of x. So, we have to again take a section and let us say we look at this part of the beam and suppose that the section is at x. Okay. So, we look at this beam which has distributed load. rho a g and this length is l minus x and at this cross section we have shear force going downward v of x and bending moment clockwise m of x. At the right cross section there is no bending moment the support does not exert any bending moment, but it does exert a shear force P okay, which is an unknown in this case. We have to solve for P also. So, when we do the moment balance of this part of the beam, let us say about this green point, then what do we get? We have minus m of x plus P times L minus x and then we also get moment due to distributed load. Now, since it is a constant, we can think of this entire red lines as being replaced by one single force at the center of this red line. The magnitude is rho a g into L minus x and this is going to provide clockwise moment. So, we get a minus sign here rho a g L minus x into the arm and this arm is L minus x by 2. So, we have L minus x whole square by 2 and that is equal to 0. So, this implies your bending moment m of x is p into L minus x minus rho a g into L minus x whole square by 2. Okay, and we can then plug it back in this equation and we have d 2 y by d x 2 is equal to p over e i into L minus x minus rho a g over e i into L minus x whole square by 2. Okay. Now, this differential equation is again a second order. So, it is going to require two constants because of it being second order, but then it has got an extra unknown p. Okay. So, this p here that is an unknown. So, we require total three boundary conditions to solve this. We need three boundary conditions to solve. So, how to get those three boundary conditions? So, till now we only used the fact that bending moment on the right support is 0. We did not use that bending moment on the left support is also 0. So, m of L is 0, we have used it already because we did not draw m of l over here, is not it? We said that m of l here is equal to 0. So, now we have to use the fact that m of 0 is also equal to 0. So, we can come back here and when we say that m 0 is equal to 0, then this tells us that p is equal to rho a g into l by 2. Okay, which is basically the total load due to distributed force which is rho a g l divided by 2. So, we have two supports here and each of the supports provide half of the distributed load. Okay. So, with p known we can come back and write it here. 
So, we have rho a g by 2 e i becomes a common thing into l into l minus x. So, we have l square minus l x minus l minus x whole square. So, that is minus l square minus x square plus 2 l x. Okay. So, these two cancel and this is finally rho a g by 2 e i into l x minus x square. Okay. And then we can do twice integration. So, the first integration tells me that d y by d x is equal to rho a g over 2 e i into l x square by 2 minus x cube by 3 plus a constant c 1. right? And when you do another integration, we get y equal to rho a g over 2 e i times l x cube by 6 minus x to the power 4 over 12 plus c 1 x plus c 2. And now, we need to obtain c 1 and c 2. So, what boundary conditions should we be using? Okay. So, what do you think? The rotation at the two supports are not 0 in this case. So, we cannot say that dy by dx is 0 at either of the two supports, but then the deflection at the two supports are indeed 0. So, we can say that y of 0 is equal to 0 and y of l is also equal to 0, is not it? So, when we use y of 0 equal to 0 and come back here, that means c 2 is equal to 0. right? You put in x equal to 0, everything vanishes except for c 2. So, c 2 should be 0 and then we have to say that y of l is equal to 0. So, evaluate this at x equal to l. So, y of l is then rho a g over 2 e i times l to the power 4 by 6 minus l to the power 4 by 12 plus c 1 into l. Okay. And you set it equal to 0 and from here you are going to get c 1 and then you obtain the deflection formula. Correct? So, this was another problem which you can solve using Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Let us work on an even difficult problem. All right. So, think of a beam which is clamped at the two ends. So, instead of being simply supported, it is clamped at the two ends and it is again going to sag due to its own weight. So, we have distributed load whose value is rho a g force per unit length is rho a g. All right. And suppose that we have the ground here and this distance is h. Now, if the weight is too much then the beam would deflect such that some part will be sitting on the surface, but the remaining part would be hanging. So, suppose that that is the situation. So, how will the deformed beam look like? So, it is going to be something like this.
right, in which this part of the beam would be in contact with the surface and let us say that is equal to delta. So, that is also an unknown. Okay. So, how can we solve this deflection problem? So, this is quite tricky, is not it? Also notice that this is a symmetric problem at x equal to 0 and at x equal to L we have the same kind of support. So, the entire deformation is going to be symmetric about x equal to L by 2. Okay. So, the deflection is going to be symmetric about x equal to L by 2. All right. Now, let us for example, have a look at this part of the beam. Okay. So, we draw that beam So, how much is this length? This would be L minus delta by 2, all right. And when we draw its free body diagram, since it is a clamped on one end, so here we will have shear force as well as bending moment m. 0 and V 0. And likewise here also we are going to have shear force V of L minus delta by 2, correct. Which is also an unknown and maybe bending moment also. m of L minus delta by 2. Okay. If you want to solve this problem, we have to first obtain the bending moment profile, is not it? So, let us suppose we go distance x from here and then take a section and look at this part of the beam. So, when we look at this section, it is something like this and here we got V r and m r, whereas over here we have m of x and shear force V of x. First of all, we do force balance and this tells us that V of x is equal to V r. So, we have constant shear force and when we do moment balance, let us say about this point, then we get minus m of x plus m of r plus V of r into this length. So, what is this length? So, this is at L minus delta by 2 and this is at x. So, we have to subtract those two and we get L minus delta by 2 minus x. Okay. And notice that we also require the moment due to distributed load which we have missed out. So, we also have distributed load acting here. And that is again a uniform distributed load. So, we can replace it with a concentrated load at the center, so which would be somewhere over here. And this is going to provide clockwise moment. So, it comes with a minus sign. So, we have minus rho a g into the length, 
which is L minus delta by 2 minus x into that same length by 2, correct. So, when we finally set it equal to 0, then we get the bending moment m of x is equal to m r plus v r into L minus delta by 2 minus x minus rho a g by 2 into L minus delta by 2 minus x whole square. Okay. So, now we can plug this bending moment equation in our Euler Bernoulli beam equation. So, we get d 2 y over d x 2 is equal to 1 by E i into m r plus v r into L minus delta by 2 minus x minus rho a g by 2 into L minus delta by 2 minus x whole square. Okay. So, now we have to think of how many boundary conditions do we need. So, again since it is a second order differential equation we need 2 because of it being second order, but then we have additional unknowns. For example, m r is an unknown, v r is also an unknown. So, we need actually kind of 4 boundary conditions. So, what can be those 4 boundary conditions? Certainly, out of those 4, 2 will come from the clamped end at x equal to 0. So, since it is clamped, there is no deflection, there is no rotation of the cross section. So, this means y 0 is equal to 0 and dy by dx at 0 is also equal to 0. So, we get these two boundary conditions. Can we also use the fact that y of L is equal to 0 and dy by dx at L is equal to 0? So, it turns out we would not be able to use them. We would not get any extra equations to solve for these four unknowns. So, we have to think of getting the boundary conditions somehow just from this part of the beam. So, suddenly there are some extra conditions. For example, what is happening at x equal to L minus delta by 2. So, this is the point from where the beam it starts to get into contact with the surface. So, that region of delta where the beam is sitting on the surface, so there it should be flat, is not it? Because the surface is flat and as the beam is sitting on the surface, so the beam also becomes flat over there. So, what can we say about dy by dx in that region? Since it is flat, y is not changing with x, so dy by dx should be 0. Likewise, all higher derivatives of y are also 0, is not it? So, basically in the region where the beam is sitting on the surface, beam is fully flat. So, this implies dy by dx and other higher order derivatives should vanish. 
is not it. So, this also implies that d 2 y by d x 2 is 0, right. So, since the curvature is 0 in that entire region, so the bending moment which is proportional to curvature should also be 0, correct. So, that means in this entire region where the beam is flat, in this region of delta, the bending moment is 0. So, that means m r which is the bending moment at the edge of this flat region is not it m r. So, m r should also be 0. So, basically this quantity should also be 0. See there cannot be any discontinuity in bending moment because where the beam is sitting with the surface at the edge we have got line contact and due to line contact we cannot get any extra couple. So, the bending moment has to be continuous from the left to the right of the edge when you travel the bending moment should be continuous and since in the flat region it is continuous therefore, m at l minus delta by 2 is also equal to 0. Okay, so, this implies that m r is equal to 0. So, we could at least reduce one of the unknowns correct. So, we took care of this unknown. Notice that this delta here that is also an unknown. So, actually we have five unknowns right, two for the integrating constants because it is a second order and then these three and we have just found out that m r is equal to 0 and we have these two boundary conditions also. So, we require two additional conditions right, so that we can find v r and delta. So, what could be the condition for v r? So, again look at this picture. What do you think is the slope at l minus delta by 2? Just now I said that in the region of contact with the surface the beam is flat. So, d y by d x is also 0 right. So, we can also use the condition that d y by d x at l minus delta by 2 is equal to 0. So, that is the third boundary condition. Now, we have to think of a fourth condition. So, what can that be? What can you say about the deflection y at x equal to l minus delta by 2? So, concentrate on the deflection here. So, the point here has moved to this point and how much is that deflection? That is h itself is not it. So, that is the fourth condition that y at l minus delta by 2 that is equal to minus of h. So, we have these four boundary conditions together with m r being equal to 0 gives me total of 5 conditions for the 5 unknowns here. Okay. So, put them in your equation and then we finally get the deflection of the beam all right. So, with this I am going to end the lecture today and in the next lecture we will learn about a more advanced beam theory that is the Timoshenko beam theory and we will also learn about buckling of beams all right. Thank you. Thank you.